All right, brother and sisters, good to see you this evening. I want to talk today um, a little bit different change of pace. So we've been talking about Daniel and prophecy, um, but um, the Lord laid on my heart a completely different direction. I hope you'll bear with me in this. And I wanted to talk about the gospel after we're saved. The gospel after we're saved. And I believe that that has to do with how we live the Christian life. So uh, if you will go with me, I want to start us off in Romans chapter 7. As Christians, when we believe the gospel saved us, it was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that took dealt with sin at its core, took away our condemnation, took away the penalty of death, And gave us resources, gave us new spirit, new life. Now, Romans chapter 7 talks in terms of laws. And we know um, from school that laws govern the world, right? There's the law of gravity. If you throw something up. It's going to fall down. There's a law of, of increasing entropy. Things don't go from chaos to organization. Things don't evolve more and more organized. Rather, they devolve. Things that are um, organized tend to become less and less organized. And one example is iron. Iron left to himself is going to begin to disintegrate and devolve, and it's going to rust away, oxidize, and basically become dissipated into the environment. So that's a law of nature. It's called the first uh, uh, the first law of thermodynamics. That there's no there's no um, matter or energy. Um, I'm sorry, it's called the law of increasing entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, and it's saying that things progress from a more ordered state to a less ordered state. So it's in that constant um, process of progressing that way. All right, so that is a physical law, but we know that there are certain spiritual principles um, it connected to that as well, right? Things aren't getting better. Things aren't getting nicer or, or more, um, more spiritual, for lack of a better term. Creation isn't getting more um, glorious, rather just the opposite, right? It's becoming more corrupt. It's becoming more... Um, the creation itself is becoming less and less orderly. God instilled order into it in those first seven days in which he created everything. He um, imposed order upon the creation. And since that time, it has been becoming less and less orderly. But here in Romans chapter 7... It talks about, and chapter 8, it talks about two kinds of laws, and we're, and we're going to get to them as well. It's the law of our mind, our carnal mind, and then in Romans chapter 8, the law of the spirit of life. So these are two kinds of laws, 
And then there is the law, right? Capital L, which is talking about the law of God, which um, he gave through Moses in, in, the, uh, in the revelation of the first five books of the Bible. And we could even include all the rest of the books as well. But when it talks about the law, it's talking about, you know, so those three, those three usages of the word law here in Romans chapter 7, you're going to notice. All right. So oh, let's read. Romans 7, 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, the law. How that the, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So all of us are under the law. The law dominates. The law um, bears rule. There's no one that's not under the law. There's no one above the law, right? All men are uh, under the law as long as we are alive. And then they use an example. And then Paul uses an example here in verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Right? Till death do us part. That's what that's the way um, the marriage vows read. And there are certain legal bindings. Um, he owes her some things, she owes him some things based on the law uh, of that covenant, of that oath, of that promise. Bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Once he's dead, then she is loose. She's free from the law. Right, so she has certain privileges, for example, and he gives you an example. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Right, if she goes and has relations with another man while she is married, she's an adulteress. She's a violator of the law, of one of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. But if her husband be dead... She is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So once her husband is dead, that law it no longer holds over her and she can go and be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So then he takes this illustration and he applies it to us. The law was our husband. And when we are dead, when the old man is dead to the law, then we are free to marry another, even to marry Christ. Now, I'm going to show you here shortly that it's not talking about the law itself, but the effect of the law through us. And this is the weakness of our flesh, the weakness of our flesh. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Sin worked in us, right? Sin condemned us to death. We were under a death penalty because of sin. That is our human nature. Body, soul, and spirit. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. So as our, as our 
being, or you could say our carnal being or our fleshly existence died with Christ on the cross. And he's referencing back to chapter six that he had um, already developed this whole theology of how we were dead to sin. The body of flesh died just as Christ died for sin. We died to sin. Right. And just as Christ raised again from the dead, we also walk in newness of life. So we being dead to sin, being dead to the law which condemns sin, and being dead to the flesh which is exercised by sin under the law. Now that's a little bit complicated, but try to follow that, that idea. We are dead to the flesh being exercised by sin under the law. Verse 5 again. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. And so he develops this idea of spirit versus letter. The technicality of the law motivates and exacerbates sin in our flesh. But the power of the spirit, or even as, he's, as he goes on to tell us later in Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life, this principle of spirit causes us to rise above the technicality of the law that um, motivates our sinful flesh. The oldness of the letter, as he calls it here. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. So he's not saying that the law of God is sin. God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. The law isn't sin. The law shows us sin. And by demanding perfection, it actually, um, it actually activates sin in us somehow through the weakness of our flesh. And whenever I say weak, I mean in the sense of sickly, in the sense of corrupt, cancerous, that kind of weakness. Not in the sense that it's it doesn't have a hold. I mean, cancer is debilitating, but is but it is tenacious. It it sinks its talons in and it hangs on. It's not an easy enemy. The same way with sin, it sinks in and it becomes a part of us. It causes our own cells to attack themselves. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Paul, raised as a Pharisee, could have said with most of Pharisees, I've kept the law perfectly from my youth. I haven't killed. I haven't um, borne false witness. I haven't stolen. I haven't committed adultery. I mean, you can go down there. I haven't violated the Sabbath. I haven't taken God's name in vain. I've always respected and honored my parents. But when you get to the very last one, thou shalt not covet. You try to justify yourself. Oh, I didn't really want my neighbor's wife or my neighbor's um, oxen or, or donkey or man servant, maid servant. You know, the way the, the means that they had of being wealthy or being, um, you know, successful. I didn't really want that. I didn't really look at the neighbor's wife. 
But he said the more he tried to tell himself that, the more the law said, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. And so the law itself exposed the lust that was already rooted in his heart. I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, there's that, somehow that motivation, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, all kinds of fantasies and imaginations and um, ad- activation and motivation of my wicked heart became activated through the law. The more the law said, don't think, don't think that way, the more I thought that way. For without the law, sin was dead. Um, If there's no one to tell you, if without the law, there's no right and wrong, right? Without the law, there is no right and wrong. There's no there's nothing to say that if I do this that there's that it's wrong. But there is a law, and therefore there is right and wrong. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. Sin take on took on a new life. Through and see as our human weak flesh attempts to fulfill the law, it is exposed in that it is weak. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why did God give the commandment? God gave the commandment as a means towards life, but for me, it was death. Now, very quickly, um, because I'm running out of time, I had two illustrations. You have to, you have to follow me, and you have to think with me, and you have to Um, Do your research um, on your own, okay? But the first story is the story of Ruth. Ruth was a foreigner. She was married to a man named Malin. Malin had gone away from Bethlehem from the house of bread. He He and his parents had gone away from the promised land, down into the land of Moab. He had married a foreign bride, and her name was Ruth. But Malin, his name actually means sickly or pining, sickly or pining. And sure enough, 10 years later, he up and died. Now, Ruth was married to Malin, and she was under the law, as long as she was married to Malin. But when Malin died, she was free from that law. So Ruth made a commitment to follow Naomi and Naomi's God. She went back to the promised land. She went back to Bethlehem, the house of bread, and they arrived at the beginning of the harvest, of the bread harvest, right? The oat harvest, the, the, um, and so they came in just as God was blessing the house of bread. And then, based on the law, she had learned that the law had some provision for her as a widow. The law guaranteed that she could go make a living. So she went out and she gleaned in the field. She she gathered the portion that's, that belongs to beggars and strangers. 
She didn't deserve it, but she was protected under the law. Not only that, but the law that had bound her to her husband, even though he was weak, made another provision. It provided for her a second husband. So she was free from the law of her husband, and she was free to marry anyone else. Her sister-in-law, Orpah, went back and married another Moabite guy. She was free to marry whomever she wanted, but Ruth chose the bride that the law provided. And the law provided a, a, a groom, I'm sorry, provided a groom. And the groom was Boaz. And who was he? He wasn't weak. He wasn't pining. He was a mighty man of wealth. And he came and he um, promised to perform the office that she um, called upon him for. And so her husband being dead, she was free to marry the mighty man of wealth. And it was the law that brought her to her new husband. Let me give you another story. John chapter 8. This is just awesome to me. I'm going to throw these up there um, as, as I go. I apologize for being behind. Um, you can go back and rewind and, and rewatch the video here in a little bit if you want to. But here's another one. Galatians 4, 1, when we read it very briefly. Building on the, the what I just read, that it was the law, the provision of the law, the protection of the law, that brought Ruth to Boaz and guaranteed her provision and her protection. Galatians 4.1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. We were under the dominion of the law, in bondage. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, right? The, that law of the spirit of life into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, dear Daddy. Have mercy on me, Daddy. Take care of me, Daddy. Provide for me, Daddy. I need you, Daddy. I want you, Daddy. Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So the point is that the law brought us to Christ. And I want to show you this specifically in one other uh, in one other story. Here in John chapter 8. I'm going to have to briefly sketch it for you. Um, here it is. So Jesus went into the unto Mount Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, 
this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. The only other mention in the Bible of writing with your finger is what? Writing the law. When God took his finger and wrote the law on the tables of stone for Moses. The law. They were coming to Jesus to find a loophole in the law. Except that they were trying to use the law to manipulate for their own wicked intentions. They were trying to use the law to manipulate a situation. They weren't interested in obeying the law and submitting to the law. They were using it to hurt other people. What was the law for? It was for, to protect them. It was to protect the most vulnerable. It was to protect those who were under. The writing of divorcement was given to protect um, a woman that is in an abusive relationship. Because of the hardness of the man's heart. Okay, so Jesus pretended like he didn't hear. Um, he was writing on the on the ground. Um, so when they continued asking him, he finally lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. All right, so if we're going to apply the law, Let's apply it evenly. The law applies to every one of you. Which of you does not need to be stoned here? Let's apply it evenly. There's also another law, right? The law condemns to death. That's what it does. He's absolutely right. Whosoever committed adultery is worthy of death. It also says, if you go back, Deuteronomy chapter 8, that to condemn someone to death, it has to be in the mouth of two or at least three eyewitnesses. Okay? So which one of you is an eyewitness of this alleged adultery? You must take the stone and cast it first. No one else can throw a stone until the two and three eyewitnesses cast the stone first as a declaration of their eyewitness account. And remember, what is the fifth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. So Jesus in his dealing with this situation is not like some would would make you think that he was dismissing the law. He was dismissing sin. No, not at all. Jesus Christ upheld the law. And the 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 um the burden of proof for the law to be upheld is that it has to be two or three eyewitnesses. You can't just condemn someone to death willy-nilly. There is a, a very heavy burden of proof there that must be met. And so we see that the law is a two-edged sword and it actually condemns the condemners. But where does this woman end up? If the law is dead, they had accused her. What? She is free to marry another. The law, these wicked men's intention of using the law to destroy her, actually was God's use of the law to bring her 
to Christ. One of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible there in John chapter 8. With that, I have to close. Um, the Lord add his blessing to his word, and y'all have a good evening.